Hello, welcome to Show Studios live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all parts of the industry discuss and debate the most important Fashion Week shows of the season. Today, during Paris Fashion Week, we're going to be discussing Chloe. My name is Jessica Bumpus. I'm a freelance fashion journalist and contributing uh, editor to the week fashion, pardon me. Um, I have a great uh, panel with me today, so I'm gonna get them to introduce themselves. And then we are going to have a look at the show and uh, discuss Gabriella Hurst's debut. So, Beth, would you like to start? Hi, um, I'm Beth Fraser. I'm a freelance illustrator, fashion illustrator and artist. Bryony? Hey, I'm Bryony Stone. I am a writer, an editor and a creative consultant. Alexandra? Hi, I'm Alexandra Castle. I'm a freelance writer based in Paris. And Katrina. Sure. Hey, I'm Gorina and I am an educator and the co-founder of a new uh, digital fashion platform called The Dematerialized. Great. Um, okay, so um, just for some context, uh, this was Gabriella Hurst's debut at Chloe. Um, Gabriella Hurst has really had, um, uh, I think, a great couple of years, has really come into the fore um, of the fashion industry. She's very much known for her sort of sustainability um, plight um, and the news that she was going to Chloe. I think following Natasha Ivaramzi, um, I think aesthetically for me, it kind of worked. Um, I would love to find out what you guys think. Um, I am just gonna throw out my opinion first. I actually do think it was a really great fit. Um, and um, the reason I say that is I think there were kind of whiffs of sort of Hannah McGibbon as well, who I always thought was very good at Chloe and always tended to get overlooked. Um, and I think it was a really like sort of modern approach to that sort of bohemianism um, that the brand is very well known for. And it seemed very wearable and it does feel like Gabriella Hurst in my mind is sort of the perfect uh, fit for that brand. But uh, I am happy to hear anyone that uh, would like to contest that um, <laughs> or agree with that. Um, and let's dissect the show. So does somebody want to jump in? I can see nodding heads. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I totally agree. I wasn't really that worried. When you hear about designers moving between houses or starting a new house, I wasn't really that, yeah, not like not worried in about it, but I thought it was, yeah, like you said, pretty easy fit. And I think the two collections as well, seeing Gabriella Hurst's own collection uh, last month, I think that was really good because they go quite well together, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, but it was exciting. I was sort of excited to see. It's always exciting seeing the debut collection, you know. And I think also, especially because, you know, Paris Fashion Week is obviously sort of digital. Um, uh, and I was sort of saying before, in some ways, you kind of forget Fashion Week's on at the moment. It's sort of yeah. when you shut your laptop, it's like, oh, it's gone. Whereas usually you're running around and at the shows. So I do think it's been nice to have something this season that underpins it sort of, um, and especially a sort of a big name and also a name that's coming up and doing very well um it's definitely a talking point yeah um, I thought maybe it was a bit of a shame that she had that it was her debut in like this kind of fashion week mm. um but it I think it worked so it's fine and mm -hmm. um, Karina you're nodding your head as well yeah I mean I guess the thing that I took away from it is it it made me feel kind of like safe and cozy and secure I think because of the knits because of the length of the of the garments I, I guess I was really looking at it from a, a consumer perspective and this idea of in the kind of tumultuous environment that we're living in in the moment it, it kind of yeah it made me feel that kind of cocooned feeling is the kind of the best way I would describe it. Mm. And Alexandra? Um, yeah, I think it was a really good start. Um, I'm really happy that Gabriella has um, taken over. Um, I can You can really get a sense of um, everything that she stands for as well, I think, in the brand. And I think she's really pushed that sustainability, um, coziness, which is kind of what we want at the moment. We've all been in the pandemic, obviously. Yet, I love that there's that sort of streets of Paris, cobbled streets, um, cobbled stones in the back. Um, so yeah, I think it was a really, really good start. And I love that she's so hands-on with the brand already, like speaking online and on Instagram. Um, so I think that's really great. Bryony? Well, where to begin? Um, I think you've got this kind of like extreme, well, what I felt was an extreme kind of cognitive dissonance of having these models walking through these abandoned Parisian streets and, and like the traffic in the background, there was something really kind of 
alarming almost about that. But then at the same time, the physicality of the clothes, that coziness that other people have spoken about. And I think it is such a specific view of femininity as well, right? Having these clothes that don't necessarily hug the body, some do, but there's a lot of, I think they're very much made from a female perspective. Um, so I liked the kind of juxtaposition between that stark background and then the idea of these clothes kind of like hugging the body almost. I thought that was pretty beautiful. Mm. And, and were there any sort of, you know, I mean, that's the sort of scar thing there. That's how I, when I was talking about Hannah McGibbon before, that's quite a, what I think about a lot with um, Chloe. Um, but uh, were there any pieces that you thought stood out or particularly that you liked or looks? Well, I guess well, I love the ponchos, but then I guess obviously something else to reference is the fact the ponchos and the puffer jackets. I was thinking like, when when does puffer end? Like, <laughs> I'm so over puffer, like I'm, I'm not interested in it at all. I feel like everyone feels the same. And with this, I kind of re-saw puffer jackets in a new way. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, next year, you know, well, end of this year that's where things are going. Um, so for me, that was clever, it was interesting and it felt contemporary as well. Mm, no, that's a really good point actually, because you're right, they, no matter how much we've sort of spoken about streetwear or sportswear in decline, it's sort of absolutely held on tight. Um, and obviously then with lockdown, it's been, and winter, um, it definitely has. Um, I guess what's also interesting about this season is that, um, you know, it's, it's autumn winter, so we are looking towards the end of the year, whereas last season everyone was kind of thinking well what does fashion look like this year when we didn't really know where we were going to be so what do we think of it in terms of a, I guess a prediction of, of where fashion is going to go or is that not even like the Chloe girl's job or Gabriella's job? Well I mean I think she presents um, I guess you could take this question in loads of different ways I think she presents a view of fashion where it's very purpose-driven obviously sustainability is like crucial to this collection and in terms of what I've read um, it's something that people are nodding to but it's like the depth at which the sustainability seems to be layered all the way through the collection is really quite remarkable um, so I think that that is a really interesting focal point for your question. Mm -mm. Um, Karina, what about you? You're nodding there as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would, well, the, what the answer, sorry, to your question before for me was that that stripy knit, the stripy yeah. knit dress, that was definitely one that I think also from an external kind of press piece and kind of looking at reactions on social media, it has a lot of visual impact to look at it. So I think that's what kind of stood out. And then I also, the kind of story behind the, the recycled bags, I love that they, kind of sought, sought them out and then added the pieces of kind of like fabric to them. I wonder how that will necessarily be done at scale in, in a kind of commercial setting, if that is what's going to happen or if it was more of the, the kind of story behind the um, the piece. Now I've forgotten what your second question was, sorry. I think I've forgotten it too, um, <laughs> but it's fine. We're just having a discussion. But actually I really wanted to just come back on what you said with the, the striped knit. You're, you're right, that is absolutely... Um, the sort of thing that, you know, if, if we still had, you know, trend supplements, that would absolutely be sort of on the front page. That would be the look. Um, and, actually, and maybe the leather one as well. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of I feel that, yeah, out of this season, that's probably going to be something that we all remember. Whereas, as I say, at the moment, I'm not really sure what, what has stood out to me. Um, but that absolutely does, because it's that kind of perfect... Um, mix of as you say there's that cocoon element which I suspect we are all still gonna want um, Need. <laughs> um Alexandra one thing that I um really liked about all of this is that you can really see that this is what people actually want to wear um and again this goes with the casting um I just think the casting is brilliant um I love I mean the last look especially um it's like uh, an older woman or whatever, normal women wearing these clothes. And this is one thing that has always sort of stuck, you know, been strong with Chloe. Um, okay. but I just think it's a lot more relevant to today um, and the different sizes as well. Um, you really, you want to be wearing these clothes after the pandemic, during them. Um, and um, exactly. And I know with this look, I mean, that would definitely be something that we definitely want to wear. Um, so I think this is really interesting and not only does the, um, is the sustainability aspect so woven into everything that she's doing, she also is donating, I believe, the, the fabrics after, um, from the collection, isn't she? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
So they're being um, remade, aren't they? The, um, in essence, the bags, um, they are being basically made by shelter suits, um, and shelter suits are basically um, then going to make from the proceeds, sorry, the proceeds of the bags um, will then be made to shelter suits. Um, I also really like that. I don't know if this is um, something that anyone picked up on, but I thought about Studio Auto when I um, read about shelter suits. Um, because Studio Water in the 90s were making one of those, like, um, basically, like, oh, multiple sleeping, well, yeah, um, sleeping bags that can be used as tents. And I thought that that was really interesting as well, because obviously Studio Water are based in Paris. So that kind of parity there, I think, is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, uh, uh, this, the, the press release on this, um, I should say, is a, a very lengthy one. Press releases can really fluctuate in what they do and don't say, but this one is very comprehensive. Um, and it also points out that um, Gabriella Hurst unveils her first collection for the Maison Chloe, 100 years to the day of the founder's birth. Um, so that's quite a nice synergy as well. And in many ways, you know, as we've kind of touched upon, she does seem just kind of like the perfect person for this. Um, what did we think about Gabriella Hurst before coming to Chloe like did we you know I wonder if she because you know she's got her her brand and then she's Chloe but are you know are they going to blur into one the same what what do we think about like Gabriella Hurst versus her at Chloe can, can that exist it's a strange like they do have a lot of similarities but I think they sort of it's almost like a day and night version to me. So I think Gabriella Hearst is a lot, seems a lot like rougher in a way, even though it's still quite feminine, but there's a lot more like leathers and things and that sort of nighttime essence. And then with the sort of newer stuff with the Chloe, it's still very ethereal, but mm -hmm. I know what you mean. I hadn't really thought about whether they'll just sort of blur into one. I don't think they'll blur. I think there's this sort of there's this difference between the, the the Chloe woman and the Gabriella Hearst woman. I feel like Gabriella Hearst, she's she's in New York, um, like can afford to obviously buy Gabriella Hearst, um, but is really chic in in you know and quite refined. And Chloe, she's Parisian, um, and I think this is a big difference. Um, and I do think that she has managed to not alienate that Chloe customer um, whilst bringing her own um, sort of, yeah, ethereal, ethereal take. I think that is, that will make the difference in the long run. Hurst also called the Chloe collection Aphrodite to her own brands, Athena. And so I really like that we have this goddess of war and we have this goddess of love and that we have that kind of sensuality and that version of femininity that's represented through Chloe and kind of always has been, I guess. So it seems in many ways, perfect fit. It's like, very modern as well to consider like what a woman is um you know she can be strong but there's also a strength within kind of like being more loving being more sensual as well mm. and I think also because obviously um Gabriella her, her stuff she's very much known for that tactility and um sort of craft element and I think that we're seeing that kind of across the board at the moment with designers because obviously the more we're on screen we actually want stuff that when we can get into the shops and touch it we will um, and it's sort of making up for the the months that we haven't been able to do that so I think what's quite nice with um, you know some of those like uh, evening wear looks as well is they're not so dressed up but they are dressed up enough because you know I wonder obviously there's this back and forth kind of conversation about like will people go crazy and it's like the roaring 20s again and just dressing up or actually will they not and it's not that it's sweatpants forever but it's actually that they've sort of been accustomed to, to dressing differently. So I do think there's a quite nice balance uh, with this collection that does feel like you're sort of rediscovering dressing up, but at the same time, you're doing it quite gently. Um, it does through so through the dress as a vehicle as well, right? Like it's all dresses, which is kind of amazing. We have like, I suppose maybe last year or the year before people started wearing, I guess, like the day dress mm -hmm. um, in, the, in work and these dresses with like more loose structures. Um, and here we kind of have that, um, but we also have, I guess, more kind of evening uh, looks as well. A bit more of a chance for, as you say, like roaring twenties kind of uh, glamour. Mm. Um, and also, I guess, you know, as, as has had to have been done, this is 
we talked about, you know, it's, well, no, it's not on set, it's Paris, it's, that's the backdrop. Obviously, other brands have done that as well. So, you know, um, and I think last season as well, they did sort of a film where it was almost like, not, not spying as such, but it was quite voyeuristic, sort of watching the girls as they walked around sort of during the day. And obviously, that was a different designer there. But, um, you know, what, what do you think about this idea that the designers are obviously having to think about different ways of presenting and do you think the street sort of worked you know obviously other people have gone super digital or really focused on films but what do we think about this Karina? yeah i think that obviously the create in, in the kind of left bank with again the kind of dark cobbled streets and that kind of eerie quiet quietness in the background uh, and they had to get special permission because obviously Paris is on lockdown and we're in our houses kind of some of us wanting to be outside so there's definitely kind of the, that kind of element which I think is nice or interesting and I think maybe the way it was done also kind of led to this or kind of exacerbated that kind of authenticity or wholesomeness that I think was quite um, apparent and what I thought was interesting was when I looked at the the social media content of the kind of mood boards behind the stories I did it didn't it wasn't fully joined up for me until I kind of properly read through the press release and I wonder maybe that was just like maybe just the social media content needs to have a bit more messaging but what they did with trying to draw similarities between Gabby and Gabriella I think was was also kind of interesting for people to kind of join the dots from a, a narrative but maybe they could have pushed it a little bit further yeah, actually, I think that's, yeah, from sort of an editorial point of view, that's probably a, a quite nice story. I think that's actually a really interesting point. Um, but I um, I find it really interesting in the way that even when she came, she's already talking about her heritage. For example, this look here, um, mm -hmm. This they called it the puff show, um, because obviously they mix the puffer and the poncho, which is great we all love a slogan um but i do i do love the story because she i think on instagram i think it was for wwd was saying how it was all about her grandfather used to love wearing um ponchos but she loves wearing puffers so i think that mixing in of her identity was present but i yeah again i almost wanted to see more of it um you're definitely seeing chloe here which i think obviously is, is brilliant not to alienate that customer. But um, yeah, I, I wonder. I did see one uh, sort of headline from a, a review that was kind of like, it's very Chloe, like, but it's old Chloe, but it's new Chloe. So, um, and I, I, I get that because as I say, I do feel, um, I don't know, Chloe is such an interesting one because when they put in different uh, creative directors, um, Sometimes you kind of wonder why, because then they come along and because the, I don't know, in, in my mind, the sort of DNA is so sort of clear that it sort of trundles along and it does seem sort of strange. Like, as I say, I really liked Hannah McGibbon. So then when Claire Waite Keller came along, I was like, not so into it. Um, and it's this, as I say, it does feel like, in my mind, a bit as, as though something Hannah McGibbon might do. So it's interesting how they keep kind of almost going like loop the loop full circles on kind of who they do get in and then get rid of and I don't know what's anyone else think and who were their favorite uh Chloe designers up until this point um I really liked having Stella McCartney I think she made a different I like when they have um women at the helm because mm -hmm. I think Chloe sort of definitely brands itself as as for just the regular women so then or, like, or real women so then I think it's quite I like when they have women designers the same with them like even just Michia Prado with her brand I think there's you can always tell there's something different about them when it's women for real women which I like mm -hmm. um but I, so, I sort of thought the same when I was watching the show the first sort of few looks were very Chloe and like you, I like what you said about it's like old Chloe but new Chloe and I was thinking that until then all the puffers start coming out and then it, that was sort of like a surprise for me, which I think was fun. And I think that's what the future will be. I think we'll just see more and more of Gabriella Hearst like putting her stamp on it and her heritage and it'll slowly sort of switch the other way around and you'll have like the surprises first and then more of the standard Chloe coming through. I think this is also an unpopular opinion maybe, but... Um... I was a massive fan of um, Natasha Ramsey uh, Livy. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I mean, 
hard worker, amazing. But I wasn't, um, I, just, I wasn't a fan of the Chloe under um, under her. Like, and so I think this is an, a necessary change. And I'm not sure. Um, I know I have loads of friends who who loved it. Um, I'm really shocked about uh, it going to Gabriella. But I, um, yeah, I think it was a, a really good decision, uh, necessary, because it was it was it was that Par Parisian girl, but not. It, it was an old, older Parisian girl that isn't really relevant to today. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Bryony and Karina, what do you think about Natasha Levi? I mean, I guess um, thinking about uh, Gabriella and thinking about, I, I suppose, like knitwear um, is something that's very synonymous with her. Um, that seems like I think the thing is right is that I think that with this first question um, collection she needs to come from a Chloe perspective and she very much has done and woven in a bit of her own influences as well as we can see like stripy dress in that bag but at the same time I think actually maybe it's even more like the stuff behind the scenes the things that we don't physically get to see the fact that she says you know like in every piece there's a sense of purpose a sense of purpose that's like so if you kind of cast your mind back five years, imagine a fashion designer saying that, that's it kind of staggering in a way. And then I also think um, she she's she's escalated, for example, um, all of the things that are around their environmental footprint. I think this um, the footprint of this collection has decreased 400% compared to last year's line, which is again, staggering. So it's all of this stuff almost for me that you can't see. And I think that we'll start to see that physically over the next couple of seasons. But I think for most profoundly, it's like all of this stuff that's in the background, maybe yeah. less glamorous, but. Mm -hmm. No, I think, that's, I think that's a really strong point as well. And also because it didn't feel, um too labored in the sort of derogatory sense and also it didn't feel over the top or kind of it, it felt like the right amount of kind of looks it didn't feel like it was a you know 90 look you know so sometimes these things can be just you know roller coasters um and even though as i say the press release is is, is massive um that's because there is so much information behind all of the different sort of collaborations or the the, the, the different elements um and also it, it's uh here she's talking about the handbags because obviously you know y2k um and uh chloe handbags was a massive thing but she's saying that my first luxury handbag was the chloe edith bag and it's a piece i still love and wanted to pay homage to um this season the edith bag has been reissued staying true to its original design uh which i think you know off the back of say like last year and Mulberry reissued its Alexa um we're really seeing this kind of you know 20 well I mean that's 10 years but you know we're really seeing this move back to it bags again what does anyone think about that because obviously Chloe is kind of the perfect vehicle for that I think this is oh sorry go ahead <laughs> no I was saying I like it as long as it's I like when it comes from a sustainable Mm. message rather than because otherwise you're just regurgitating the same thing that's already existing um but I read that for a lot of the ones I don't know if it's probably more the ones on the runway that they were sort of reworking but they bought a bunch of um the Chloe bags back for themselves but from eBay which I thought was really cool because it's just like it just that's probably why most of them are which is nice um but no, I like it, but I think, yeah, you've got to do it. I like that they've gone with the sustainable route rather than like, like, was it Burberry you mentioned bringing the back? Mulberry. Oh, Mulberry, yeah. That as well, yeah. Whereas the new Alexas are, are sustainably made. So oh, sweet, so, yeah. Like, like they're it bags, but now they're like, they're actually it because they're made. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Alexandra, sorry, you were going to say something. No, this is uh, what I kind of similar to what I was going to say, but I think again with, um, I mean, even Jewel with their saddlebag um, and what is, I think is really interesting is this world that happens on eBay, on Vestia Collective, on Depop um, or where, wherever you get your um, vintage bits and bobs. Um, but I think this is a really interesting world for designers to play into, um, especially right now. I mean, let's be honest, these brands are struggling. They need to be really intelligent about how they target um, these audiences. Um, I mean, even if they're not struggling, I think it's it, it's a really good thing for them to, to do in a completely 360 way rather than what you often see, which is the sort of, I don't know, greenwashing or 
mm. when things are just on a long press release and they're not really taken mm. to the full um, maximal poten maximum potential. It says the, um, the new uh, Edith family includes bags in recycled cashmere or with recycled jacquard um, and is offered in different versions. Um, I think that's quite, because obviously bags you spend a real lot of money on, like they are these days, you know, it's not 2004 anymore, like they are really expensive. Um, so I think, yeah, if you are going to obviously sort of um, promote that message and, and, and use that as a vehicle to spread it, then obviously it does make sense that it be a bag because those are such kind of trophy items. And in some ways, it's the easiest thing to do because again, you don't have the issue with like clothes having to fit your body, you just get to hold a bag but, you know, doing it more sustainably. So um, what does anyone think of the shoes? The big sort of, you know, big shoes. <laughs> Look like slippers. I like the, um, you know, the all exactly this one. I think they're great. Love mm -hmm. them. They, they just feel very now, don't they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I can't even, I was looking at my shoes this morning and I was like, I haven't worn you in a year. Like, <laughs> all I ever wear is exactly the same, like, but like hairy clogs, they sound disgusting, but they're fabulous. Um, and when I see these shoes, I'm like, yeah, I want to wear them. I want to wear them every day around my house. Great. They definitely have, again, that sort of, um, yeah, as you say, they feel very now of the moment. And in the same way that that, that look in itself, it, it feels like that's going to be the shoe. I don't know. Does anyone mm. else sort of think that? Yeah, potentially. I mean, or well, something I maybe wanted to bring up as well is that yeah. I think this collection is going to be quite or I think the price point of the collection is going to be much higher probably than it normally is because in the press release they talked about kind of upping the 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 wool content in each of them and when I think about kind of uh, maybe old Chloe um I think a, a lot about kind of like denim and um like silk blouses that are kind of like iconic and like there was a few silk silk pieces that I kind of saw in but most of the pieces in here like look like they're pretty pretty much in that kind of investment category kind of piece which is another reason why I think it, they're quite transseasonal as well like in the in the kind of looks and thinking about kind of emerging out of a post-pandemic world what kind of products or product categories are, are people going to be spending money on so I think there's a I don't know there's a, a a cleverness a strategicness to that as well as it kind of like working well I suppose it, yeah they I guess in many ways they do have to be investment because you can't sort of be a, a designer that's sort of um pushing sustainability but then saying you keep having to buy stuff because it sort of undermines that that point I'm really interested to see you know her next collection because um I, like where is this going you know should it go anywhere basically because you know how often designers get kind of uh yelled at for not pushing it far enough but then they get yelled at for pushing it too far like what now that she's there how does that change the um status quo like does it doesn't it you know will we expect to next season will we, we be chastising her for not having pushed it on or mm. actually will we be commending her because we're like you know it's the investment pieces and she's you know continuing the message what do we think um I mean I read a good quote from her this morning that was um tradition over trend which mm -hmm. I like because she was really embracing sort of the artisan methods and really like researching suppliers and manufacturers and um I think she's sort of saying that she'd rather take her time and get something right than rush to be on trend and rush to have a brand new collection. And I think with everything going on as well, everyone's sort of slowed down. So I think that's kind of a nice, it's sort of quite nice timing that you can then start this new sustainable route and really take the time and get everything eco and nice and well-made rather than focusing on the trend, which is I think something that she's really good at is she's quite, level-headed I think about keeping like stick, sticks to what she believes in and just sort of believes in the the message rather than just the actual physical clothes coming down the wrong way and the the sort of the message has more impact than the clothes if that makes sense mm -hmm. I think. Alexandra what do you think? Oh you're on mute. We've said, <laughs> we've said the, the phrase is the <laughs> I knew this would happen eventually. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I agree completely with you. Just one thing earlier, you mentioned about the shoes that I kind of wanted to go back to. 
Um, I know so many brands have been talking about like um, what, equestrian, equestrian boots and they've been through the roof uh, on reseller websites. And one thing that I'm quite glad is that there still is this sort of like equestrian style to Chloe um, that I think um, people are interested in at the moment. Um, then again, I completely love the um, the sort of sandals um, as well because it's definitely something that we all want to wear. Um, but yeah, that's what. What do you think? Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually, I am just genuinely interested as well. Just to go back to sort of what I was saying before, like, do you think? I will, f will the fashion industry uh, allow that idea of the message over the trend? Cool. Like, I think it's really interesting that at any other time, I don't think this would have been feasible, but because yeah. the pandemic put a pause on everything and everyone went, okay, let's stop, let's think about this. Um, it, it's kind of created this like little breathing space, which I don't think would have existed. And I think, you know, remember when Claire Wake Keller went to Givenchy, that debut collection, the kind of overriding feeling was like, it feels like she's held something back, what's coming next? And she then needed to kind of like change that. And I know the MO there wasn't like sustainability, um, but you know, that wasn't so long ago. So I'm really interested to see how this like relationship develops because there's kind of two different, com well, there's, yeah, there's different conversations happening parallel um, with one another. And I feel like they definitely feed into one another. Um, so, yeah, I am interested. I, yeah, I mean, I think she will um, uh, get, I think if she continues this kind of marriage, uh, successful marriage of the, of between hers and, and the history of the brand aesthetics, I think obviously that will be, will kind of continue to win people over. Mm -hmm. I think, again, because to go back to the kind of the product categories and the, the, the things that she's done, I think that will improve the margins internally from a kind of merchandising perspective. And so that will take off maybe some of the pressure about um, having to, to sell a certain amount of units. I think for me, um, I think there hopefully will be maybe a little bit more pressure on teasing out and making that kind of the the sustainability stuff maybe more tr more transparent and, and, and more clear um, and I, I kind of find it a little bit funny that in some ways that but maybe this is the pressure of the, of the house or of the group that um, she's still doing a collection in some ways in, in the traditional um, fashion weeks um, I kind of think that moving towards a kind of zero, zero infantry or kind of made to order um, model again, because she's also quite an advocate of technology as well, previously having kind of worked on blockchain projects um, with her own label. So I don't know, I would like to see something like that happening next season where nothing is manufactured um, until there's this kind of like buy-in from consumers and, or, and kind of buyers or something. I think that would be interesting and hopefully would have a trickle on effect to the, to the rest of the, the other brands as well. Mm. I think that's a really interesting point, especially because if you think about it, I mean, 10 years ago, sustainability, would we really be buying a high-end luxury brand um, if it was just completely sustainable? That is just insane. It was just so shocking for people. And then now it's finally, managing to trickle up to the top and I think you know finally but I think you know you, she, you really have to credit her with that um because it's it's not easy um and still there is this price point would you buy would you ultimately buy something that's from a high um, you know high-end brand um if it is completely recycled um so I think changing that dynamic and changing that conversation is something that she really needs to continue and keep pushing um and keep pushing forward. Bryony, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think there's something that we haven't touched on here yet, which is, um, I guess, like this fusion. There's a lot of pastness in this collection for me. It references the 60s quite heavily. Um, and we have those ponchos, which are again filled the 60s, but also the fact that they're from her grandfather. Someone else has made that point already. but. I think that's kind of interesting when we think about trend is that she's not only is she not creating anything that, that feels necessarily new, but she's consciously referencing um, the past in a way that feels pretty eternal, actually. 
Um, and I think that the, the one concession to that would be uh, a puff, puff of poncho, puff <laughs> Um which I think is clever and I think is interesting. I think, yeah, that's the thing that feels most, I guess, future facing um, for me, but everything else pretty timeless. Um, and I think that that is to a certain extent what Chloe is known for, um, this kind of like vision of femininity that's like always evolving, um, but always feels somehow relevant. Mm. Um, I'm intrigued to know everyone's thoughts and this isn't just specific to to Chloe or Gabrielle Hurst, but um, it's it's more just, you know, in terms of Fashion Week next season, and it's touching on, you know, Karina, your point of like doing something that's completely, um, you know, it's not a runway and it's sort of zero everything. What, you know, what what are your predictions or your thoughts or on where Fashion Week should go next? Just as it is Paris Fashion Week, and we are doing these panel discussions. Where do you see them going? Where is their place now? Just because as again, we've had this interesting year um, and, and we're seeing people having to adapt. Um, any thoughts or predictions? I mean, I can go first if you want. Um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> I guess, a, an evolution of what I kind of just mentioned in that because a lot of brands are, for instance, starting to invest in digital prototyping um, and things like that, I think um, that opens up new possibilities for how you show the collection. I think it also is useful in terms of potentially moving that into a zero inventory made to order kind of like basis as well. And also potentially um, selling those digital assets as digital assets in themselves. If we're also kind of thinking down this kind of new NFT route as well. And I think maybe from a, I don't know, I think we're all very familiar with the, the issues of overproduction and overconsumption. And I think we have a duty as consumers and um, also as kind of stakeholders within the fashion industry to just kind of challenge and, and push back on, on maybe the traditional models, which I know are much debated and kind of like discussed about in this context. Anyone else? I agree. I think the model needs to be rethinked um, completely because I mean, I, I'm in Paris now and it's just, you, you would have no idea that it's Paris Fashion Week uh, other than the fact that we, you know, are writing about certain shows or, or whatever. Um, but I think, it, I think eventually a, a lot of these things will have to change, whether that is less, less shows every year um, or not. Um, it, it's definitely interesting and, and, and it will change for sure. Um, I saw I I like the digital route or like how everything's moving, and then I think um, places like Copenhagen Fashion Week nailed it completely. I think they've they've done a really good job with getting everything really um, online, and then but they also come at it from a sustainable route again. I know that's like the buzzword of this discussion, really. But um, in terms of being more eco-friendly fashion week as a whole isn't very <laughs> eco-friendly anyway like the set designs that go on and the, the like the costs of lighting and flying people in and like it's actually quite that's just as bad as some of the manufacturing of the clothes in a way so then I think it's quite good going digital because it the sh so the fact that they just did this show on the street I think was really cool I mean I know there's still lights and things but it's a lot more chilled out than you know some of the I think I can't remember how much it was but the Chanel shows last year with like the crazy sets and stuff I mean they're stunning but like I think they were using real trees and they had like chopped down real trees for it and it's, it seems crazy now now that we're this far on I think it's really interesting that <laughs> finding <laughs> I think it's really interesting they're finding new ways um, to go about doing these shows, definitely. Um, I mean, there is so much production that goes into these videos, though I have to say. Um, they are, I mean, huge teams, but obviously, no, it's not the amount of security and set design, perhaps, um, that would have gone into to the shows otherwise. Um, but one thing that I will say is that, I mean, all the shows are accessible now, which I think is great. The amount of times we, I mean, probably all... Um, had to deal with door security or trying to get accreditations and press accreditations or just even plain sneaking into shows, uh, which I used to do all the time. 
Um, but I think, yeah, I think the fact that it's accessible, it really shows that the brands are really trying to actually have to open their horizons and try and please everyone, not just the front row, um, which I think is only, can only be a plus to the brand. Yeah. So what better way to visually demonstrate that than to have these models walking like right the middle um, of a Parisian street? Perfect. Well, I think that seems like a good note to end on. Um, so um, thank you to all the panellists and thank you all for watching. For more extensive Fashion Week coverage before, uh, can't ever do this right, be sure to visit showstudio.com. And if you're watching via Show Studios YouTube, be sure to like, comment and subscribe below and we will see you next time. Thank you and bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.